Hi, my name is Omar. I'm an A&E Rep Registrar. In this video, I'd like to talk about preparing for the final FRChem SBA exam. So this exam is one of the last written exams before completion of emergency medicine training. And it's really, really difficult. So I'd recommend uh, getting a pen and paper and taking, taking some notes because there, there's going to be a lot of information coming at you thick and fast. Let me take you back to uh, when I uh, sat, sat this exam, in fact a couple of months just before. So I had been applying for this exam for about two years. Uh, I ended up not getting accepted um, to sit the exam because of COVID and because of a change in eligibility criteria. So when I got my acceptance email saying that I, would, I, was, uh, I was able to sit the exam in December 2021, I was quite excited, um, but my situation oh, was that I have two young kids, both one and two years old, and I've, I was only spending 10 to 20 hours per week in the emergency department, uh, just keeping up my skills. I wasn't, I wasn't really uh, at the peak of my knowledge and, and performance. So. Um, the way I had to revise was that I'd end up looking after the children during the day. I'd go to bed, put them to bed exhausted, sleep for about three or four hours, wake up in the middle of the night and revise for one to two hours, then go back to sleep again. Um, and I was more or less doing that every other day for about eight, eight weeks. And then occasionally my wife would take the children to the in-laws uh, for a weekend, um, perhaps every three weeks, and during that weekend I'd just cram in as much revision as I could. But if you think about the total number, so the exam was March the 15th, uh, 2022. So if you think about the actual amount of hours I must have put in, it was a lot less than other candidates were doing. For a fact, I know that other candidates were sitting in the library every day um, taking uh, taking time out, study leave, uh, unpaid leave to to revise for this exam. So what was my approach that was um, that was different? Um, that's something I want to talk about a little bit later. But first, I want to talk about some of the topics um, that you should mm, that you should focus on in the, in the exam. So when people look at the uh, format of this exam and that distribution of the marks, they tend to focus on SLO1. The reason for that is because the majority of the marks are allocated to that area. It's 35 marks out of a 100, 180 mark exam. But I found that SLO1 is, it covers almost any topic in medicine and surgery. Um, in almost any specialty up until the point of resuscitation. So it's actually a very broad scope and it's difficult to focus your focus your revision. So what I ended up doing is when I got um, accepted, to sit, uh, accepted to sit at this exam, I discussed uh, a strategy with my mentor. And what we decided uh, to do is that to help me prepare for this exam and eventually to help others prepare for this exam is that we would write questions. And he was going to cover uh, SLOs 1 and 3, and I was going to cover uh, SLO 7 to 11. I'm oh, sorry, SLO 5, 7, uh, 7, all the way up to 11, the rest of the curriculum. Um, so I was writing questions on the latter half of the, of the curriculum. That's paediatrics, um, procedures, organ donation, information governance, critical appraisal, quality improvement. Um, and those are areas of the curriculum that tend to be uh, neglected. People have less of an idea going in to the exam without any, without any preparation of, of those areas compared to SLO1 and SLO3, that's for sure. So I, um, what, what ended up happening is that a couple of weeks just prior to the exam, I said to, to my friend, look, I prepared all, uh, all these questions um, on the exam. What have you got for me? Can, have you got anything on SLO1 and SLO3? Can you send me your questions over? 
and he ended up not preparing any questions at all. Um, but it actually worked out in my favour, I think. Um, although it was kind of, I was worried at the time whether I was uh, whether I was going to pass, but um, but I ended up, I think, making up the difference by focusing on the latter half of the curriculum. And those topics uh, tend to be, tended to be high yield. For example, there were four questions in, in my exam on organ donation. Uh, and there's topics, like I said, that people tend not to focus on. For example, tracheostomy care, um, procedures, that's lumbar puncture, escherotomy, resuscitative hysterotomy, um, thoracotomy. Um, and then also quality improvement. So that's like measuring variation in the in the department, different tools to improve quality, for example, uh, so or different models for quality improvement. Uh, and then also critical appraisal. Um, those, those, like I said, tend to be neg uh, neglected areas of the exam. And it's w worth putting in some time to prepare to prepare for those topics rather than leaving them to the end. Another rich source of questions is looking at ARCHEM patient safety alerts and also national patient safety alerts. Um, those questions on those like bat button battery ingestion, magnet ingestion, um, anorexia nervosa, nervosa, those are uh, a rich source of potential questions uh, for the exam. Another thing to look at is uh, specific guidelines, so NICE guidelines or BTS guidelines on specific topics, for example, pneumothorax or NIV. Those are, those are also worth looking at the, the summary diagrams, usually in the appendices of those, of those guidelines, because they're easily testable concepts in the exam. And finally, another resource to look at is ARCHEM best practice guidelines. Those cover uh, unusual topics, for example, managing abnormal results, abnormal radiology results uh, in the ED, like incidentalomas, for example, or managing suspected internal drug trafficking, acute behavioral disturbance. Those are topics that aren't necessarily well covered by emergency medicine texts. So I've just discussed about uh, some of the high yield topics that you'll see um, uh, reflected in the questions in the exam. Now I want to talk about some of the typical question patterns that you might see. Now you've all done uh, either the MRCM SBA or MRCM SAQ. And there are similar question patterns in this exam. So some of them will be familiar to, familiar to you. For example, what is the immediate management step? A case scenario will be put out to you um, and you'll be asked, what is the immediate man management step for this patient? And it's usually a temporizing maneuver, an interim measure before de definitive management. For example, something like a needle decompression in a tension pneumothorax or a jaw thrust in an unstable airway. Another common question, actually the most common question in the exam, is what is the ne next best management step? For those questions, it's important to look at what interventions have already taken place in the narrative. A common problem is that people don't properly read, uh, properly read the question. Uh, so they don't take into account what has already taken place uh, in the scenario. And secondly, they don't put themselves in the shoes of the person in the scenario. By putting yourself in, uh, in the scenario itself, thinking what you'd actually do in real life, that helps you answer those, those kind of questions. Another kind of question on those, uh, on those lines is what is the definitive management step? For example, um, a case scenario will be, will be laid out it might include an image like an ECG um, or an ultrasound image, and you'll be asked what is the what is the definitive management step. For those questions, um, obviously image interpretation uh, is important, 
but the answers are going to be uh, permanent solutions, not interim measures like for immediate management. They're going to be permanent solutions like a chest drain for a tension pneumothorax, or it's going to be uh, inserting an uh, endotracheal tube or a surgical airway, for example, in an unstable airway patient. There are some question patterns that are dissimilar from the MRKM SBA or MRKM SAQ that you might have sat that you will have sat before. For example, a, a case scenario will, will be laid out, and you'll be asked you'll be asked which uh, which risk factor in the history warrants uh, admission for this patient. So you'll be asked about risk relevant risk factors or important risk factors uh, in, in the history, or contraindications uh, in, in the history in the history given. And to be honest, for those questions, you need to know your guidelines inside out. For example, absolute contraindications to an IV, or um, knowing the risk factors for admission uh, in a bronchiolitis patient. For law and ethics questions, uh, a typical uh, a typical question pattern is which of the following statements is most appropriate. Sometimes this is used in the critical appraisal questions as well. Um, and really, for those, you need to understand uh, the underlying law. For example, Mental Health Act, inside out, to be able to answer those questions, or you need to understand the principles of, of critical appraisal. To be able to, to to be able to answer them. Finally, the, uh, another common pattern is you'll be uh, another common pattern in in the exam is you'll be asked according to which guideline, according to a certain guideline, um, what is the next appropriate step or what is the appropriate management for this for this patient. So again, you need to know the relevant guideline. Uh, through and through to be able to answer those questions. So I've just talked about seven common uh, question patterns that you'll see in the FRKIM SBA exam. Now I want to go back to strategizing your preparation for this exam. So you'll remember the story I gave at the beginning about how my revision was uh, was limited by my circumstances, so I was only able to revert, revise for about 60 to 90 minutes a day. So how did I end up, end up focusing my revision? What did I do that was different? Well, I had to do something different. We all have to do something different for this exam because it's, it's a new exam, very broad in its scope. Um, and there aren't any questions, there are very few questions available online uh, online that are relevant to this exam. There are some private courses that offer that offers questions, but I found they weren't really similar to the question pattern that we see in the FRKM final SBA exam. So what I ended up doing is writing my own questions. And you might think that's quite time consuming quite time consuming and quite difficult and yes it is but I found it useful in a number of ways firstly um, it changes your perspective of the exam from a candidate sitting it to an examiner so you'll end up paying a lot more attention to the wording of, of a question a common problem that candidates face is that you end up you end up narrowing uh, a question down to a couple of options uh, only, and you're stuck between between this option or that. What I found with my approach is that I found that situation didn't arise very often, because I was able to understand what the examiner need wanted from me, but from the wording of the question and how the wording of the question would be different if, if it was for the other, if it was favouring the other option. So yeah, it, it changes your uh, perspective. 
Secondly, is that to be able to write a question requires a lot more knowledge than to be able to answer a question. So it takes more time, um, but you ended up knowing a topic deeper than uh, perhaps some, a candidate who has simply just answered a question. Um, and that's actually funda that's actually rooted some in some in educational theory. To be able to create requires a lot more knowledge than to be able to apply knowledge. Finally, um, what I found with writing questions is that actually I would end up forgetting or forgetting the exact wording or forgetting about the question maybe a couple of weeks later. So I was able to answer my own question as a kind of refresher, and that sort of and that formed a kind of um, pattern of space repetition for me. So I end up trying that, that question I wrote maybe a week later, and then maybe a couple of weeks later or after that, after that, just to keep my my knowledge going. Um, so I so I, would, I wouldn't forget it before the day of the exam. So I would really recommend writing questions and sharing them with others. So you participate in a value exchange where, people, where you can share questions with others and um, you can reinforce, uh, reinforce areas of the curriculum that you haven't necessarily covered with your own questions. One final thing uh, before I sign out from this video is thinking about time uh, in this exam, how to manage your time. And most candidates uh, I've discussed with haven't found a problem with time, but um, it's worth paying some attention to uh, and, and keeping track so, um, so that you don't make a major mistake on the day of the exam. What I found uh, worked for me is um, using, uh, using a milestone for, uh, for every 30 minutes I needed to complete 25 questions. So by the end of the exam, by the last half of the exam, you know, I was, I didn't have any pressure, any time pressure on me. I was able to go at my own pace and I had about 15 minutes to look, look through some of my answers or look through some of the flagged questions that I had raised, raised earlier. So yeah, just to recap what we've covered in this video, I've talked about some of the high yield topics um, in the exam and how to focus your, your preparation. I've talked about some of the classic uh, question patterns that you'll see in the exam. Um, how your preparation needs to be different for this exam compared to almost every other exam that you sat before, simply because there aren't the resources available. And finally, I've talked about how to strategize and, and manage your time uh, in the exam. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.